Fantastic, you've been accepted to a great MBA program, or you hope to be accepted to the MBA program of your dreams. How do you make the most of the experience? Our guest today just wrote the book on that topic, so we'll learn about his experience at Stanford GSB, as well as how you can get the most out of your MBA. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 437th episode of Admission Straight Talk. Thanks for tuning in. Before I introduce our guest, I have a question for you. Are you ready to apply to your dream MBA programs? Are you competitive at your target programs? Accepted's MBA admissions calculator can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accepted.com slash MBA quiz, complete the quiz, and you'll not only get an assessment, but tips on how to improve your qualifications. Plus, it's all free. Again, use the calculator at accept.com slash MBA quiz to obtain your complimentary assessment. I'd like to welcome to Mission Straight Talk, Bob Manfreda, Stanford MBA and co-author of Coffee Chats, thoughtful advice on how to get the most out of your MBA. Bob earned his bachelor's in applied physics and Chinese at Notre Dame, worked at Deloitte as a consultant, earned his MBA at Stanford as an R.J. Miller scholar, and is now a manager at Deloitte. He is also the chief booth officer for Photo Fox Photo Booth. Bob, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Thanks, Linda. Happy to be here. Okay, great. Now, my first question, burning question is, do you like coffee? <laughs> I do. I'm actually, I made myself an iced coffee for the occasion. Okay. My daughter's a big fan of iced coffee. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, you were at Deloitte before you went to Stanford GSB, and you're now again at Deloitte. Did you intend to return to Deloitte after your MBA as, as you've done? Intend might be too strong of a word. I, okay. I knew it was a strong option and it was one that I was excited to have. I, I was sponsored to go to school and right. so there was a carrot to come back, but I also wanted to explore some other careers um, just because I'd been at Deloitte for four years already and there was a lot out there. I think I had a little bit of like, I don't know, uh, wanderlust career-wise. And mm-hmm. so I, I did some poking around in, in venture capital in mid-stage startup and then entrepreneurialism. Uh, which was a list of three things that I came up with that I thought would be, that would allow me to maybe be financially equivalent, but still explore something new. And I started like working my way through that list. And for whatever reason, I never really got a lot of momentum on starting my own thing. Uh, I realized after a couple of coffee chats, actually, that venture capital probably wouldn't be something for me. And I, I interned at a mid-stage uh, tech startup and had a great time, but it just, it didn't really work out from a career perspective. Uh, there wasn't necessarily a path there. And so when I got to my second year in Deloitte, made the official offer to return, it, it felt like the best thing at the time for me. Has it worked out for you? It has. I mean, Deloitte's a, a good company. It's, uh, they've got great benefits. I'm, I'm currently actually on paternity leave. We had Ooh. our first son. So that's like- Congratulations. Great- How old yeah. is he? Thank you. Jackson is six months old. Ooh, that's a fun age. It that's is. a fun age. Yeah. And my wife, actually, she works for a company called Snowflake. Um, they just uh, they updated their policy to six months. So she had a bunch of time off. Anyways, long story short, now I get month six to 10 off with Jackson, which I'm really excited Ooh, about. Okay. And so going back to consulting for me, I think there was the professional benefit of getting to, to manage people soon and to continue developing some of like the core skills. But I think there was also the personal element of it that I knew I'd have that benefit available to me of good pat weave uh, and I'd be able to kind of go to where I want to in the country. So there was, it was a bit of a more than just a professional decision. Usually it is. Yeah, um, fair enough. That's, uh, that's pretty typical. But congratulations again. Yeah, thank um, you. Well, let's, let's turn to your Stanford experience. What did you enjoy most while you were a student at Stanford GSB? I think it was the freedom to choose like every single day. Uh, there was, as I kind of went into school and reflected on life growing up uh, through school, like the goal was always me getting better and pursuing an interest, right? Like that's the, the mandate of educational institutions. And when I went to the professional world, uh, that was certainly a goal, but it wasn't always goal 1A, right? It's usually like profits or something related right. to that. Right. Um, 
in going back to school, I could go play pickup basketball or read a book and on the quarter system at Stanford, choose a different class every three quarters. And my classmates were all incredibly passionate about things. And so I just, I felt like every day I got to wake up and explore something new uh, and whatever it was that gave me the most energy that day. And, and that was a lot of fun. That's a very exciting uh, way to look at it for sure. Yeah. Um, and looking back on, on the program, the MBA program, the education, the, the extracurricular opportunities, uh, whatever it was, what class experience or extracurricular activities were most valuable to you or really stand out in your mind? I think there's two um, in particular and everyone's got different goals, right? And so right. I think that will drive a lot of the outcome to this question. And, and for me, uh, the social element of business school was not a priority. My own relationship and my personal health was, um, and neither were some of like the career pivot uh, options that were out there. So I didn't end up doing many clubs or those things, which also could be really good experiences for other people. And so I got a lot of value out of classes, actually. And in particular at Stanford, um, there's the whole soft skills kind of curriculum that Stanford's built its brand around. Sure. And, and touchy-feely touchy being the keystone. <laughs> There it is. Um, but it's so much more than touchy feely, right? It's the whole environment at Stanford that's like built in that ethos of emotions as the basis of connection. Um, and that made me very uncomfortable, right? Like I, I grew up with a tax lawyer of a dad. Emotion was bad. It's the enemy of reason. Like, <laughs> don't be emotional. And, and Stanford challenged all of that for me, but in a way that was, uh, I think, really helpful and pushed me to become a better version of myself. Uh, I I can relate to people more frequently and on easier terms. I have less arguments with my wife. So my personal relationships have never been stronger. And professionally, uh, like the summer in between year one and year two, I remember getting frustrated with my manager at the time at my internship. And I think old Bob might have argued why something else was done incorrectly and why my position was right. And new touchy feely Bob said something like, you know, I'm a little frustrated right now, or I feel frustrated. Can we take a step back? And that was totally new to me and not something I ever would have done. But like that a week and a half into my internship was the total pivot point for what ended up being an awesome relationship with my manager that summer. Because instead of us fighting over what was right or wrong, we like took a step back, related on kind of how we were feeling about things, what drove that what we needed to do to correct how we were working together and then got back to the core of it. And to me, Tushy Feely, the Arbuckle Leadership Fellows, a lot of the similar classes are all like centered around that idea and those types of experiences for getting to know people. So, yeah. yeah. That's all right. That's wonderful. Um, so, yeah. it, wasn't what, it wasn't the ex answer I expected. It wasn't the answer I expected, particularly because your book seems to talk so much about the value of everything but the classes. Huh. Yeah, well, and that's a tricky one because I think that's a common element for the MBA in general, right? It's like people feel that way. There's so yeah. many resources available to you at school that I think that can be true. For a lot of people, class isn't the core part of the program. Uh, for me, I was excited about the academics of it. And so I, I got a lot out of that. Um, to be clear, if it was just touchy-feely, it wouldn't have been as powerful, if not for the community and the people and the experiences around it. But um, like everyone's goals and experiences with the MBA are different. And it just so happened that for me, I think class had a pretty awesome part of it. I also um, am noting, and I've always maintained, well, for years, that's for sure, that the goal of your MBA should be front and center as you apply, and that it will also help you, not that you can't change it, but it will also help you in prioritizing when you're in business school itself. Totally. You know, that's what you, you did. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, that's exactly right. There's so many things coming at you, at me, and setting a couple things aside helped me make the most of what I decided to prioritize. Um, and I think people so often talk about prioritizing as a big theme for business school. I think it's possible to over-prioritize. I think more often people don't prioritize enough, but I do think that is like one of the central themes to like having an effective MBA experience. So I think that's great advice that you tell people. Thank you. What could have been improved? Even though, even though I know Stanford GSB is a fantastic institution and experience, what could have been improved for you or what do you wish you would have done differently? That's actually a great segment. Uh, one of the comments I just made, which is I think it's possible to um, over-prioritize, mm -hmm. which is I think a mistake that I made. 
Okay. Uh, I mentioned going into it that I decided that I'd focus on either a startup VC, right, or a growth stage, or am I starting my own thing, excuse me. And looking back, I feel like those are three things of the very similar flavor to what I was already doing, like consulting, it's very biz op, you see, it's like business strategy. Um, And I, I don't think I did enough to open the aperture going into school because I kept hearing from people, it's so important to prioritize uh, that way, you know, like which lunches to go to, which classes to take, what to work on. But there are so many amazing resources at these schools that you don't have before you show up that can be helpful in finding new things to do. Right. And so, yeah, everyone has different goals for the MBA, like like we were saying, but a, a very common one is uh, to get into a certain career, whether it be an elevated position or a different one that's a professional degree. Right. And I think to the extent that you over prioritize prior to school, you can sub optimize your professional outcomes because you're not seeing everything that's out there. Um, and specifically for me, I realized during my second year of school that search funds and sales careers both were actually really interesting and played the things that I might enjoy, but they were just much different than the experience I'd had previously. I wasn't familiar with them. And because I over prioritized, I didn't start exploring them until too late in my, my two years there. I'm wondering how one could kind of balance that. I mean, need not yeah. to try everything and, you know, at the same time focus maybe with more exploration before you get there. Totally. I think, I think that's one of the places coffee chats comes in actually, okay. yeah. because at the end of the day, the best way to balance this is to have like a, the test and fail method, right? Which is so common with startups now is how quickly can you have a thesis, test it, and either set it aside or decide to invest further in it. Um, one of the things we talk about in the book is why a preschool internship could be valuable. Sure. Some more idea. That's another at bat at testing a career. Yeah. And I think one of the quickest, lowest time investment opportunities to explore things are, is the coffee chat. Um, right. These schools are so focused on curating a diverse class of students that if you reach out to people at your school, there's a very good chance that someone will have done what you might be interested in. And in a 30 minute conversation with them, you'll learn like a ton about whether it may or may not be a good fit. And that's what happened for me with venture capital, right? Like the way it was described to me is it's uh, a hugely extroverted job where you're meeting new people, you're out there, you're exploring new companies um, and and you're creating these deals in large part on your own. And for me, uh, that felt tiring, not energizing. And what coming from a very team-based consulting environment, I, I was a little unsure if I'd like the single environment. And so instead of spending a whole semester and hours investing in VC recruiting, I was able to rule that out after a couple of coffee chats. And I think that's like, that, that's the whole essence of this book, right? Like having conversations early before you show up. And then again, once you're at school, you can start broad, but then try to prioritize quickly down to what, what you do want to spend your time on. Great advice. Oh, thank Are you. you glad you're enjoying the I am glad. I think so often that question um, is evaluated on extrinsic terms. How much did I pay for the MBA and is it worth it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I'm not sure about that yet, to be perfectly honest. I think it'll depend in the long term. Um, If I was trying to be a middle manager for my long term career goal, I'm not sure it would be, to be honest. The MBA is really expensive but I'm hoping it creates lots of upside for me. And I think between the network, the, the sticker on the resume, there's a few ways it could do that. Um, but intrinsically, right? Like I learned a lot. I feel like I'm a better person from some of the soft skill things. I made some good friends and I really enjoyed those couple of years. So it was a luxury, uh, but fortunately I had a partner who was working full time. I had a company that was willing to sponsor it. It was a luxury yeah. that I feel like we could afford and I really enjoyed it. Okay, great. So it sounds like you weren't glad. Now let's turn to, to coffee chats, okay? Okay. Um, now the, the book, I mean, I thought the advice you just gave was great for applicants, but the, the focus of the book really is on advice for admits. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm positive that there are people listening to this podcast who would love to attend Stanford GSB. What advice do you have for applicants who want to get a, a Stanford MBA? Yeah, um, I mean, Good luck. The application process is a slog. It's hard. It's introspective. I'm, I'm still not sure why I got in, to be frank. Yeah. Um, but the, the two pieces of advice that I'd give from the, or I guess three that I picked up from some of my classmates that I thought did a good job. One, 
don't overthink the what matters most to you and why. For most people, it was a simple concept with a bunch of stories behind it that shows why it was very important. Um, two, the whole application should be related. Like what matters most to you and why should be largely personal. So it's like why Stanford should build on that. Those aren't two separate questions. Um, and then three, right, Stanford's whole motto, the, the emphasis on driving change, I think is really important. And I think they like people who are willing to think through the implications of their actions and how their goals will affect others. And so if you want to, you know, start a nonprofit that'll feed the world, obviously there's an easier link there, but you also might be someone who wants to be a consultant partner or a private equity leader, right? Like the goals are varied, but don't just want to be that for its sake itself. Like maybe it'll create jobs, maybe like how will it affect the world? And I think telling that story is really important for the GSB application. Mm -hmm. Great. It's, it's the impact you want to have. Through whatever totally. you want to give you. Right. Well put. Yeah, exactly. Right. Now, what are coffee chats? Coffee chats are kind of, yeah, already. sounds good. Coffee chats are kind of what we're doing right now. It's That's a conversation, true. right? Questions, mm -hmm. answers, back and forth. And it's something that people do a lot at their MBA program. In, in life in general, uh, I felt like they were very frequent when I showed up at school where people would say, hey, you seem interesting. Like, let's grab coffee and chat. A good way to get to know people, typically one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes it's a beer. Sometimes you don't get anything to drink. But coffee, for whatever reason, is typically how it's referred. Okay. How did you and Adam Potterman, your co-author, who's a Kellogg MBA, and also your pre-MBA colleague from Deloitte, come to write the book, MBA Coffee Chats, or actually first it was the blog, MBA Coffee Chats, and then the book, Coffee Chats. Yeah, well. Which I enjoyed, by the way. I thought it was, it was good, it was succinct, it was short. It is I, short. I enjoyed it, yeah. But that's Thank not a flaw. That's, yeah, hopefully not. It's meant to be a feature, not a bug. But, exactly. Um, we, you know, Adam and I both found ourselves enjoying and having lots of coffee chats every year. Right, working at a big company like Deloitte, and then at these schools, you get put in touch with friends, siblings, friends of friends, like, hey, I'm interested in going and would love to pick your brain about it. Mm -hmm. And we found ourselves having often similar conversations with people. And, you know, sometimes if we were higher energy and, you know, better fed and well slept, our answers might be better, <laughs> and others, they wouldn't be as good. Sure. And, you know, Adam and I kind of realized that while talking kind of every couple months during school. We had become good friends while we were colleagues. And, uh, as a bit of an aside, one of the things that we, we talk about in the book, right, is the importance of finding ways to remember everything getting thrown at you during school. And mm -hmm. one of the things that Adam and I found ourselves doing was just chatting once a month, once every two months. It sort of happened organically at first and comparing notes like, mm -hmm. oh, man, you're doing a lot of team projects. I haven't had any yet. Like, how's that driving? Your, like, what's happening? What are you learning from that? Um, and so... As we were having those conversations, we came across or we realized that we were having a similar experience with coffee chats. And then at the same time realized, hey, we'd like working together sometime. What's a good way to test that? And all of these things sort of dovetailed together to, hey, it'd be really cool to write about this and to put some of our better answers together. At first, just to you know help people that we were having conversations with. And then those seem to be received well. So then we thought, hey, like, why don't we put it out on Reddit? Like we both are on that website a fair amount. Like we can hit up our MBA and see what happens. And that also got some good traction. And it sort of just was a path of serendipity from there. Uh, during, during that, we, we got in touch with a, a writer of recommendable books who's also now a publisher. He ended up being an advisor to us. And uh, as our book was finished and we kind of were sharing it with friends more informally, he then suggested publishing it and we started working with him on that. And then we went through the whole publishing process. And, and now I'm here sitting talking with you, right? Like it's amazing <laughs> how the, the journey kind of has unfolded over the right. past. You also were, I think, interviewed by Poets and Quants, weren't you? We were, yes. Yeah. I think that's where I, I came across it. No kidding. Yeah, we, yeah. again, serendipity. Mm -hmm. A friend of ours put us in touch with them from doing a, not a podcast, a panel for a, a local club. And, and yeah, so it's been a lot of fun. Did you and Adam ever kind of compare the cultures at, at Kellogg and Stanford or discuss some of the similarities and differences? Yeah, we, we all the time. I mean, in one of our interesting theses, I think interesting anyways, to pat myself on the back, is that these schools are more similar than, than different. People get real hung up on right how the culture and, and the differences between them, but all of these schools have wonderful professors and resources and academic institutions, uh, an intense social scene with a lot of A-types who want to get out there and be active, very good job opportunities, interesting clubs, lots of travel. And a lot of times we hear, um, if you ask people a question like, what do you love about your school? We hear the same answers repeatedly. 
Um, and so we compare our cultures and in, in that sense, there's a lot of similarities, but the differences are, I think, often what are more interesting and what drive difference. And I think the differences we noted about our two schools, uh, again, after all of those similarities and positive things is that um, Kellogg has a, obviously a very intentional team-based culture. And Adam's like, I can't imagine not doing a project with a team. Stanford, I think, creates a very choose your own adventure academic environment. And um, I hadn't done any projects with teams because I would often opt to do them on my own because then I could squeeze it in at 1130 and be home to be with my partner at the end of her work day, right? Like I had flexibility by doing it my own way. Um, and so the result was very different attitudes around working together versus Stanford. I think uh, everyone was exploring their own thing. And there was certainly plenty of team culture and, and teamwork as well. But I think the emphases were different. That's a really interesting observation. And I I would have anticipated that, but I, I think it's it's particularly probably particularly valid coming from you, given given your close friendship with, with Adam and, and the fact that you're doing this at the same time. Uh, the, yeah, yeah, it's it's a really interesting observation. Now, I'm sure there are opportunities for teamwork at, at Stanford, but the option not to have have uh, as many team projects is probably more relevant or more more prevalent rather at Stanford. Now, mm -hmm. in the book, you identify several key questions for admit. And I would, I would personally argue that applicants should give these questions some thought too. And the, the, the biggest one, the biggest question you have is how can I make the most of my MBA experience? How would you answer that question? Ah, Linda, I think you already did in a way. Um, it's a the goal. Might have touched it already. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, but so I, I don't want to, I want to give you, I really liked the advice as you put it earlier, right? Like the goals are so often front and center as an applicant and during your time there. Um, and then I think finding a way to stay true to them the speed and the pace and the level of interesting things that I think are made available in the first few months and then throughout the time there. Uh, you have a, an incredibly uh, smart group of people who I think are still very prone to herd mentality uh, where they will swarm to whatever the it thing is um, because everything is interesting and exciting and it can make it hard to stick to those goals. Right. And so I think having the goals up front and then finding the time for intentionality to step back Right. And whether that be talking with my buddy, Adam at Kellogg or, or writing, if you're a writer, like finding a way to kind of revisit those goals regularly. Um, and I think, again, I think coffee chats are a great way to do that because it forces you to say it out loud, to bounce ideas off people and to, to reevaluate them as needed. To get input from, from people with different perspectives automatically, they're gonna, you know, they're different from you. They're going to have different perspectives. Totally. I mean, because having goals doesn't mean they can't change. Right. No, as long no, as they it's change. Not a stra they're not supposed to be straight jackets. Totally, yes. And that's what's I, I many times use the metaphor of, of a weather vane. In other words, if, if you don't have any goals, you just spin around. Mm. But if you have a, a have a goal, it's pointing in a certain direction, but it can still shift. Yes, I really like that. That that's totally true, right? And and so often it will throughout your time, and it should. Yeah, and it should. Happens. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, one topic you addressed in your book is preserving your relationship with your partner, who at this point is your wife. I don't know if you were married at the time. Mm -hmm. And you noted that both you and Adam were able to do so. Could you, you review the suggestions you gave on that topic? Yeah, and, and Adam is a great person for this. He's actually right starting a relationship wellness company. Oh. He, he helped okay. form a lot of our thoughts around this. I, I think the big thing is just intentionality um, around your time and again, your goals. So I, I think for most partners, there's two ends to the extreme. One is we are gonna do everything together. And my, my SO, my partner, the non-student is gonna be involved in everything socially. Uh, and the other end is they're not gonna, be involved at all, right? <laughs> right. Um, and obviously there's a lot of space in the middle. Ironically, Adam and I took somewhat different paths where my partner was from the Bay Area where I was in school, had her own job and kind of decided early on, hey, I, I don't think the, the, the Stanford MBA crew is for me and I've got a lot of other things I gotta do with my own life right now. Right. Um, and so that was fine as long as it wasn't a surprise and it meant occasionally I missed a happy hour to go home and, and cook dinner together. Um, and I think for Adam, it meant the, the two of them would go to things together frequently, right? And enjoy their time in that way. Um, Adam's, Adam especially helped us put a whole bunch more tactical things in the book. I think one included like carving out specific time, right? Like whether it be a Sunday morning or a Tuesday evening, whatever works for you. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that as a teaser to read the book, actually. <laughs> okay, okay, great. It really does run, run the gamut. Uh, we had on AST a 
a, a Columbia MBA who I think whose wife was attending classes, you know, just, just sitting in on <laughs> classes and going to all the events and very involved. Mm -hmm. And I remember when, when I was getting my MBA, we got, I got married in, in between the first and second year. And my husband had a full-time job. He had lots of other interests and he was certainly supportive of, of the time I needed to devote to the degree. But mm -hmm. when graduation came around, he was like, Linda, do I really have to go to it? And I was like, yes, you do. <laughs> this one, yes. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to hear anything about it. <laughs> so um, he, he, he got the message. And um, <laughs> said, okay, okay. But <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a great example of clear communication. And a priority. <laughs> <laughs> And we we're celebrating our 43rd anniversary. So it, it worked. But, right. um, Congratulations. Yeah. But, um, right. Uh, it, I think communication is obviously critical. So the, the, other, the other point you made, by the way, was setting expectations mm -hmm. both mm -hmm. ways. You know, Absolutely. The student's expectations and the partner's expectations. Because part of what's so hard, and I'm sure people listening to this can relate to how different their college undergraduate experience schedule oh, yeah. than their working schedule. And that's exactly what happens now, right? Like one person is in an undergraduate school schedule and the other person is working in the real world with air quotes. Um, and so setting expectations when pe two people are occupying such different mental mind frames and mind mindsets and schedules is incredibly important because otherwise you just, it's ships passing in the night all the time. Right, right. right. What are your plans going forward? Any more books? more coffee chats what do you what do you think you're going to do yeah definitely more coffee chats uh adam and i i think well, i'll speak for myself i i really enjoy them it's a lot of fun connecting with people sharing experiences and i find i learn a lot from it like how people are thinking about their goals what they've worked on so i think coffee chats will always at this point be a front and center tool for me in, in my career for work personal life is a way of staying in touch with people more books is an interesting question. Um, it was a really rewarding experience. I got to do a whole bunch of things I, I had not done before, including recording a podcast. Thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> I'm um, sure you'll have many. I'm yeah, you'll have many. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think, I don't know if we'll write more books on the MBA topic. One of the things we were always very cautious of, and I mentioned this when we were talking beforehand, was we, we don't wanna be seen as having all the answers on the MBA experience, right? It's something that is so personal for a lot of people with different goals and different ways yeah. to go about it. So I think we, we've said our piece. And as you noted, the book is short in part because we realize there's, there's a small number of tribal factoids or knowledge sets that I think are widely shareable. But for most people, you still need to have the coffee chats to figure out what matters or what's most relevant to you personally. Um, but I'd love to write a book about a different topic at some point in the future. It was, it was a lot of fun to re-engage with uh, the poet in me, uh, whereas I've always been um, a quant. Why Chinese as an undergrad? <laughs> Just uh, occurred to me. <laughs> yes. Oh man. It's, Physics and ch Chinese, and that's an interesting combo. It's a it was, well topic, but for, yeah, why not though? For me, I mean, it was maybe it wasn't overly well thought out. It was a pursuit of interest, <laughs> okay. right? Physics was hard. It was interesting, and it explored the world around me. Sure. And I wanted to be. Work. Yeah, and I wanted to be an engineer, but I was in such a rush that when the school told me physics and Chinese would take me five years excuse me, engineering and Chinese would take me five years. I said, mm, never mind. I, I want to be gone in four years. And I switched to physics. Um, and that was like the whole reason for physics. And, and Chinese, ironically, my, my dad, when, who's one of my greatest mentors and role models, I think when I was a sophomore in high school, was like, hey, you should really learn Chinese. There's a, a lot happening in that part of the world. Oh, yeah. And, and then I did it. Uh, unfortunately, I, I got pretty good at it and managed to forget all of it, just about. So I studied it for six or seven years. And it's amazing how when you just don't practice something different than what you do every day, you lose it. Yeah. Right. right. All right. Let's, let's go back and, uh, to, to the book and your plans and stuff, all that kind of stuff. That, that question, though, I meant to ask it earlier on, and it just, it just popped into my head. It's kind of an unusual combination. Is there anything that you would have liked me to ask you or anything you want to share at this point? Hmm. One of the things we touched on a little bit that I'll, I'll come back to because it's my personal drum that I've banged a fair amount is that uh, these schools are most different based off the academic experience and location. I think they're very similar, but that's my opinion because I think the time you spend in school 
is significant. And just like work doesn't define your day-to-day experience as a, like as a professional today, but it does affect your happiness because you spend 40, 50, for some people up to 100 hours doing it. Um, the classroom environment, whether you need to prepare for a cold call and case environment or not, whether you have required classes or not, right? Whether classes are mandatory or not, all has a big impact on kind of how your time is available to you. And so I think um, as an applicant, that's hugely important to, to suss out and understand about where you apply. Um, on the other side of school, I think it's really interesting when people apply to both the GSB and HBS. Um, I, understand, <laughs> I understand why they do it, but I also, sure. yeah, it's two phenomenally different experiences. Um, and then obviously location is different and can affect some of the career outcomes. And like we were talking about earlier, I think too often people underestimate the importance of academics with the MBA. Uh, but even if it's not your goal, it like if you have to prepare for class every day, it will affect how much time you have to work on your startup, for example. Right, right. right. So, mm-hmm. And when you talk about location, are you talking more about like region of the country or world? Certainly world makes perfect sense. Or are you mm-hmm. talking about big city versus small city, um, weather? Mm-hmm. I mean, what? When I said it, I meant region, um, mm-hmm. right? Like the Stanford class of 2019 GSB or whatever, WhatsApp for the, for the Bay Area is 250 people, right? right? Like it is a full WhatsApp thread and there is a ton of people here. There's a healthy amount of people in New York, but like most other places don't have is just. Uh, That's about half your class. Yeah, it's it's more than half the class, right? It is, yeah, and I'm sure yeah. some of them have moved in and out, but like there are nodes of uh, much more saturated environments. I think after school, um, and it also can affect career, right? Like uh, Berkeley and, and Stanford have incredible access to tech startups right now. I sure. think you see that in, in outcomes. Columbia with finance, Wharton with finance, and generally and PE as well. I think those locations can affect your career outcome, but also just where you want to be in the world afterwards. Right. Agreed. Well, mm-hmm. excellent point. Thank you. Bob, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, I also appreciate your sharing your experiences and perspective. Where can listeners find your blog and learn more about Coffee Chats, thoughtful advice on how to get the most out of your MBA? The book. Yeah, we are at mbacoffeechats.com. Okay, great. Well, we're going to link to MBA Coffee Chats as well as the book and related podcasts and articles, including... Um, some interviews with other Stanford GSB grads. We're going to link to them from exhibit.com slash 437. Quick reminder, don't miss the MBA admissions quiz. Find out if you are really ready to apply. Competitive at your target schools? Take the quiz at exhibit.com slash MBA quiz. You are concerned that you missed something in today's show or wanted to take a note or two, but couldn't because you were driving, jogging, or doing the dishes? We've done it for you. You'll find the show notes for this episode at exhibit.com slash 437. This is Admission Straight Talk, produced by Accepted, and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week.